Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording. You please don't come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. I'm taking pictures of the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I'm in the ramble, and there is a man, African-American, who has a bicycle helmet. He is recording me and threatening me and my dog. There is an African-American man, I am in Central Park, he is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. <laughs> and my I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I'm in Central Park in the ramble. I don't know. Thank you. Hello everyone, and I would like to thank you for joining me for chapter five of An Education of a Black Man. Uh, before we begin, before we begin, I'd like to once again uh, spend a send a special thank you to those who checked out my last video, which was on the uh, Confederate flag. I I felt like I learned a lot. I really was I, I I liked what that video represented in terms of growing our knowledge, in terms of understanding a a flag that's been consistent in our history and yet I didn't there was so much that I didn't know so thank you for those who checked out that video and then I also want to send a special thank you to those who went ahead and subscribed to the channel I really truly do appreciate that from the bottom of my heart thank you for continuing this journey with me and I hope it's a journey that you stay with me and we, we actually continue to grow and learn um, for this video I I wanted to focus on Karen's that was that was my whole plan uh, this week I thought that Karen's was it was such an interesting term that, you know, when I was in high school and I was a kid, you never heard. I never heard of somebody referred to as can, uh, as a Karen. And it's only recently within the last few years that we started applying this term to people. And I think the first time I actually heard it was with the, uh, the girl who called the police, um, the woman who called the police on the black man who was barbecuing. And I, I'm seeing this word and I was thinking about how it's a... It's a funny way to describe a dangerous situation. It's a funny way of saying that there are certain individuals who have decided to infringe upon the rights of others or insert themselves into others' lives in order to make it harder or difficult or to bring harm to them. She thinks it's cute that her driver almost hit my kids and she thinks she needs to take a video of it. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. You want to call the police on him for having a barbecue on a in Sunday a at the lake. Yes. And that, that really struck me because I, I don't know, whenever I, I see a Karen meme or I see a new Karen video, your, your, your inclination is almost to laugh because you're like, oh, here's another one being, you know, being dumb. Here, here's another example of somebody taking their privilege and, and doing the most with it. And then it started to bother me a bit because I was like, no, wait a minute. That, there's real damage intended for the people that they're um, confronting. Uh, for example, with the video we just showed, that was, make sure I get her name right here. That was Amy Cooper, uh, Amy Cooper, who was in uh, Central Park walking her dog in an area that had to have dogs leashed. And she didn't want her dog leashed. She wanted it to run around. And there happened to be a black man there who was bird watching. And he confronts her, tells her that, you know, basically you have to leash your dog in this area because you're, you're messing up the, the, the environment with your dog running around like that on top of disturbing the birds that he's trying to watch. She takes a lot of offense to it. And then as you see in the, in the clip, she's, she's not only a bit irate, it seems, but she's also threatening to call the cops. In fact, she not only threatens to call the cops, which the black man responds with, please do. She then says, I'm threatening to tell them that a black man, an African American man, is threatening me. She she knew in that moment that if I threaten you with the idea that the cops are coming, you as a black man should respond to the fact that I'm going to tell them you're black and be scared. And then when she calls the cops, she's adamant three times or so, telling them that there's a black man, there's a black man, there's a black man. She says African American man, but we know what he means. It, there's a black man who is 
threatening me. At the end, she jumps an octave. She makes it, if we didn't see the video, it, she makes it sound like there's a man killing her. It sounds like there's an episode of Criminal Minds going down, and if the cops don't get there immediately and, and make some quick, rash, deadly decisions, this woman's gonna lose her life. I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the Ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I'm in Central Park in the Ramble. I don't know. That's how her voice is coming across the phone. And meanwhile, we're seeing this unfold in this video camera. And it's just like the manager, he hasn't made a motion towards her. He's not even really speaking. He's just recording her. And it's not until the end where he was like, basically, yep, thank you. Thank you for calling the cops because he realizes I've done nothing wrong. Thankfully, I've recorded this video so I can show officers. And I I'm thankful that it went down the way where he was able to share that video and is still alive to this day because we've seen times where people don't walk away from the situation. A white woman says something about a black man and it's, it's going to be bad news for the black man when the cops respond, especially one who sounds like she's screaming bloody murder. Um, and so watching that video and then knowing that I want to talk about Karen's, I was like, well, maybe I don't want to focus on just Karen's. Maybe there's a, a deeper issue that I want to get to. And I felt the best way to kind of exemplify the issue was taking a look at a, a, a very infamous case, a case that we've talked about before. I know I've referenced him in chapter three with the Kendrick Johnson case, which again, thank you for those who checked that video out. Um, but Emmett Till, and just realizing that there's there's a a deep dark ugly history between white women and black men and black boys and and it's been there since slavery times there's always been this i, I don't even know what to call it, this relationship that bothers and scares people because it, let me be first and foremost i don't give a i don't give a damn who you date who you choose to be in bed with at the end of the day none of us should care because that's your choice that's your decision but when it comes to black men and white women, there does seem to be some kind of history there that perturbs a lot of individuals, perturbs. But um, and in and, and the case of Emmett Till, there's a strong, scary power that white women exude over not just other white men, but on black men and how they can affect their lives. And in the case of Emmett Till, result in a brutal death for him all based around the lie and we're going to get into the lie but it it karen which is typically a white woman who's like overstepping her bounds and and seeing how they're using the police on black men and in which her case she was lying she was lying it made me immediately think of emmett, emmett till which is why we're gonna delve into this case for chapter five chapter five is gonna be on emmett till again i want to give a, just a little warning that i'm gonna be showing images of emmett till again so if you haven't seen them before, they are a little bit graphic. Also, I want to make sure that I'm clear that it is a kind of disturbing case that involves a young 14 year old boy. So some of the material may be graphic. And if you don't want to listen to that, I, I suggest I, I see you in the next video, depending on what the next video is. Uh, but for those who stick around, this is Emmett Till. So Emmett Till, who was known to his friends and friends and family as Bobo, was 14 years old, born July 25th, uh, 1941. And just in case you see my eyes moving again, I, I took a bunch of notes uh, for this case just to make sure that I was well prepared and did justice to this young man, as well as um, I've got a screen up here with the story that was published, basically interviewing the killers and them coming clean with what actually occurred that night or their version of what occurred that night. I feel like it's a bit of alternative history to the cool truth because it seems to paint them in a way where they're not a hundred percent bad guys they're like justified in their actions and I, I don't believe that for a damn second so i'll share their uh their side of events but then i'm also going to share what the family who was actually there and is still alive has said about the uh the events that occurred so what we're starting with this is in the summer of 1955 emmett till had been living in chicago with his mother and his family had moved from Mississippi. And I'm not sure when they moved, whether Emmett was a baby or before, but either way, he was supposed to be going back home to visit his great uncle and great aunt, which was the preacher Moses Wright and his wife Elizabeth Wright in Money, Mississippi. Emmett has been described as a bit of a prankster, an extrovert, an outgoing kid, a kid who likes to be the center of attention, which is great lovely beautiful except it's 1955 and they're about to head down to mississippi so 
the family sits Emmett down to try and explain to him that, you know, when going down in Mississippi, you can't do the same things that you were doing up here in the north because the laws are not really the laws. We're talking about Jim Crow, segregation, south, south, south era. Bad things will happen. Consequences will occur if you try and pull the same things that you pull up here. People aren't going to find that funny. There's real deadly consequences. Um, so they sit him down and explain that. Emmett is then sit down with his cousin, Wheeler Parker, who's about 16, to uh, Mississippi. They get there on, I believe, uh, the 21st of August, 1955. And for the first three days, there's there's no incident. Good time visiting family. Um, it isn't until August 24th that Simeon, which is the preacher Moses' son, who's 12 years old, uh, Emmett, and his cousin Wheeler, and I think it's reported a group of, it was a total group of eight, so seven boys and one girl, all end up going down to uh, Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market, which is owned by Carolyn Bryant and her husband, Roy Bryant. And just a little, little backstory on them. Carolyn Bryant is a white woman of Irish background, about 21 years old, and she married Roy Bryant, who was 20 years old, former military, um, and they're both extremely poor. They pretty much live in the back of their shop, and their shop is dedicated to serving uh, blacks primarily who work in the cotton plantations nearby. <clears throat> they have no vehicle. They really have no money. But Roy has a huge family on both his mother and father's side. I think he has something like four brothers on his mother's side, four brothers on his father's side. Or There's intermix. I think there's some girls in there too, but the point is he's got a really huge family, which will kind of come into play later. So Emmett and his friends are all outside Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market, and it said that Roy had built a checkerboard outside of that store, and the kids were playing checkers out there. Well, while playing checkers, Emmett had started to brag that he had been with a white woman before, in fact, he had a uh, white girl waiting for him back in Chicago. He produces a picture showing off the uh, white woman. And I'm going to read something from the um, the side of the murderers, the, the article that was released with the murderers' confessions that kind of shows how the conversation went. So one of the youths go, you talking, you talking mighty big, Bo. There's a pretty little white woman in the store. Since you know how to handle white girls, let's see you go in and get a date with her. Another of the uh, kids say, you ain't chicken, are you, Bo? Now, it's the same talk that so many of us have as kids. Somebody states a fact, you kind of check them on the fact, and you have one of two options. You either continue on and prove yourself, or you kind of backtrack and lose face. As I said, Bo's a little bit of an extrovert. He's confident. Um, he's, he's a not defiant, but he's a strong kid, you know, and you'll kind of see that later on in the story as well. I really respect Emmett and who he was as a young man at 14 but here the stories kind of diverge about what about what actually occurs once Emmett goes inside the store now you have the version that's given to us in the confession the killer's confession story but then you also have the version that is given by Emmett's cousin who is still alive to this day and recently shared that uh, side of the story and I'm more inclined to again believe the cousin side of the story because what does he have to lie about really Versus the killers who are, like I said, it seems like the article is a bit kind of painting them in a justifiable light. So I'll tell both versions. The first version is, and this is from the, the killer confession side article. Emmett went inside the store and he went and bought two cents, uh, two cents worth of bubble gum from the lady behind the counter, which was Carolyn. She hands him the candy and then he supposedly squeezes her hand and says, how about a date, baby? She jerks away and starts moving for Juanita. And I should explain that a bit too. Juanita is her half sister that is married to J.W. Malam, who also is a central figure in this story. But because they're such a big family and they're poor, Roy oftentimes has to do jobs that take him away from the store. Carolyn's left there to man the, uh, the store while he's gone. At this particular point, Roy is gone to Texas uh, moving shrimp. He's moved shrimp from New Orleans to San Antonio. So he's out in Texas. Carolyn's mining the store. And I guess in this area, as they describe it, you didn't want to be a white woman moving around by yourself. So while Carolyn was in the store, usually one of her sis her step -sis stepsisters or half sisters uh, would stay in the store with her in the back with their kids. 
And at night, because I think the story closed at, mm, it's either 11 at night on the weeknights. No, it's 9 at night on the weeknights and then 11 on Saturdays. Then the uh, one of the brothers would come pick the ladies up and take them home. So this particular day, Juanita was staying in the back with their kids. So after she jerks away from Emmett, she moves to go and tell her uh, half-sister, Juanita, about the incident. Wherein, supposedly, somehow, Bo or Emmett moves around the counter and kind of blocks her path to go to the back room to tell her. And then kind of grabs her around the right waist and then reportedly says, You needn't be afraid of me, baby. I've been with white girls before. At this point, they say that one of the cousins outside hears and sees all this going on, runs inside, grabs Emmett, takes him outside the store because he notices that Carolyn is no longer going to tell Juanita. She's going to the car because Juanita had driven her husband's car to the store that day. And underneath one of the seats was a uh, 45. So they thought Carolyn was going to get the 45 to shoot Emmett. So all the kids pack into the car and they drive away. The other side of the story from uh, the cousin, which I believe it was Wheeler Parker, the cousin that had traveled down there with him, says that that is not at all what occurred. Everybody's got this misconception of who Emmett is. And in reality, what occurred that day is Emmett went inside the store and said nothing. There was no words exchanged between him and uh, Carolyn except for to buy the candy. And it wasn't until Emmett left the store that he decided to wolf whistle. And everybody heard it. It was a loud wolf whistle. And you, you've all heard the whistle before. Um, and upon whistling, the kids around him are terrified. Most of the kids are there from the South. They, they know what this means. This is Big Trouble, 1955, segregation, Jim Crow era. So they immediately get in the car and they get out. And one of the family members, um, it might have been Simeon, uh, who is a 12-year-old preacher's son, who said that, you know, when asked about it, said that we all scattered because, like, throwing a baseball through a window, you don't stick around to find out what the trouble is going to be. So they go back home to the uh, preacher's house, to preacher Moses's house. And for the next few days, things are kind of quiet. You know, they're thinking, okay, maybe this will kind of blow past us. And the reason that nothing has actually occurred is according to the article uh, from the K killer's confession, Rory, like I said, was in Texas and he didn't get back until Friday morning at around 4 a.m., during that time, Juanita and Carolyn had decided that they weren't going to tell their men about what had occurred in the store that day because they didn't want to get their men angry, reportedly. They say this, so really the only people who should have known then were the kids and those two, uh, the two women in the store. Now, I don't see the kids going around and running their mouths about that, but then again, they are kids, but just because they know the danger associated and what could happen to their cousin if they decide to tell this story. I don't know how it got out, but apparently by Thursday, because this all happened on a Wednesday, by Thursday, word had spread around the uh, town that Emmett had had this encounter with the woman. And then by Friday afternoon, once Roy had uh, gotten back, slept in, it was now helping Carolyn at the store. Uh, reportedly, a black man came in and started to tell Roy about what, what the word was circulated in around town, what the talk was. And once he hears that, Carolyn decides to come clean and tell him the full story, her version of the story of what occurred in the store. He's pissed. He's infuriated. 1955, young black man has basically, in his mind, accosted his wife. He wants vengeance, but he can't do it that exact day because the store is apparently super busy. And then he can't, and he doesn't have a car either that day. So he can't, can't drive down there because I think they're like 2.8 miles outside of town. Also, he can't do it the next day, which is Saturday, because that's supposed to be their busiest day. So instead, at like 10.30 or so the next day, Saturday uh, night, he calls up his half-brother, J.W. Milan, who is the brother of Juanita, and tells him that, hey, be ready, get your car ready, I'm going to need you tomorrow morning, early tomorrow morning. Well, Milan's response, reportedly, and again, this is all coming from like the article side, is that they have church in the morning, and it's the only day that he can sleep in, so he'd rather do it around noon. Then... Roy tells him the story of what had occurred between his wife and the uh, and Emmett and JW, who is very, very anti-black, says, I will be there early. He leaves, goes and fuels up his car and decides that he can't he can't wait till morning. You know, he's he's amped up now. He wants to go do it now. So he goes back to the store once it's closed up, picks up Roy and says, let's go do this now. So they both have forty five. Um, excuse me. 
they both have 45 automatics on them. Uh, I know they say that JWs came from uh, his service in the army, and it's reported that it's the same weapon that he used to use to beat um, Germans. Uh, pistol whip them to get information out of. Maybe not the same, but it was the same uh, brand. And so they go over to the preacher's house, and they knock on the door, and there's actually real-time footage from Preacher Moses about what occurred that night when the two uh, approached his household. Sunday morning, about 2.30, uh, I heard a voice at the door, and I asked, who was it? And they said, this is Mr. Bright. I want to talk with you and the boy. And when I opened the door, there was a man standing with a pistol in one hand and a flashlight in the other. There's another kind of um, telegraph version where he says, where he says, Roy Bryant pounded on the door. Preacher said, who's that? Roy says, Mr. Bryant from money, Preacher. Preacher says, all right, sir, just a minute. Preacher came out of the screened in porch. Bryant, which is Roy. Preacher, you got a boy from Chicago here? Preacher says, yes, sir. Roy says, I want to talk to him. Preacher says, yes, sir, I'll go get him. Now, some people may wonder why the preacher went to go get his, um, his nephew, when two white men who were brandishing actual weapons uh, and flashlights at, I think this is around 12.30 a.m.? It's, or no, 2, 2, around 2 in the morning. Um, you know, and they're wondering, why did you go get your son? And he says that, uh, based off what they said, he actually did believe that the men were just there to talk to his nephew because he, too, had heard the rumors about what the young man had did and he grew up in the same era. He knows what the rules are. He knows that there's got to be some kind of consequence. But he just doesn't believe that these men are going to kill his nephew. He just thinks that he's going to talk to him. And there may be some physical repercussions for it as well. So the two men barge at the house. They move right past uh, Simeon. Uh, not Simeon. They move right past Wheeler, who, you know, he's scared to death, shakes. Uh, but they move right past him. Simeon's sleeping in the same bed as Emmett. Simeon uh, wakes up and, you know, he's thinking he's probably in trouble too. And instead, they tell Simeon to go back to sleep and they wake Emmett up. And then Emmett, who was sleeping in shorts, is told to get dressed. And there's a moment here that I think is kind of kind of powerful and a little bit representative of the Emmett that they're trying to paint in the Killer's Confessions article. And I don't know how true this is, but I do like it because it does show a resilience in Emmett that you don't normally see in somebody so young. There's a power to this. But Basically, as he's getting dressed, he's um, moving to put his socks on. And the men are, I think JW, who's the more vocal of the two, like I said, really, really anti-black, says to him, don't put your socks on, just focus on your shoes. Emmett tells him that he doesn't wear shoes without socks. So he makes the men wait to put his shoes back on. And I, I, there's something in that defiance, in that strength of telling these men who are in your house with 45 pistols, wait, I'm going to put my socks on. This is what I've always done. I'm going to keep doing it. So he gets up, and as they're getting up, the preacher, you know, and his wife are begging. The preacher tells them, hey, my, 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 he don't know no better. He's just a young boy from Chicago. We're sorry. Um, and then Elizabeth, the wife, tells the, uh, the men, I will pay you. You know, please don't take the boy. I will pay you money for the, 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 the pain and suffering he's caused you all. Roy is reportedly said to have kind of hesitated at this moment because, like I said, they're extremely poor, so he's kind of – thinking about like okay i'll take the money and we'll call it good but jw is adamant that he he doesn't doesn't care about money i'm taking this boy we're gonna go teach him a lesson also it said that when this event occurred because i was thinking the same thing i was like why didn't they get this young man out of here like he clearly did something that everybody's terrified of and word spreading around town that he did it why is nobody moving to get this young man out of town and it said that when emmett went home he was he was kind of pressuring his family, like, I want to go back home. I, you know, I want to go back to Chicago with my mother. And I, uh, one of the little girls that was actually in the group, like, was also highly reporting, like, hey, he needs to leave. Like, they're going to kill him if he doesn't leave town. And the only person, or what's reported is that to, to have happened is Elizabeth, the preacher's wife, said, no, you need to stay, stay here and finish your visit. So that's how he ended up staying there. Which is sad, really, really sad, and I, I hope that's not true of what occurred. But um, again, I want to stress that both of the parents that night thought that they were only going to talk to the boy, 
And if they took him, they didn't think that they would kill the boy necessarily, which I'm not exactly sure why not, but they didn't think that is what happened. But so the two men take Emmett into their truck, tell him to lie in the bed, and they drive off. During this time, Preacher and Elizabeth go to their neighbor's house, who is white, tell him about what occurred. The neighbor says something about, or it comes out and, and looks around for a bit and then decides there's nothing he can do. So he goes back inside, and then Preacher and his wife go to, uh, I think, her brother's house. And her brother, later in that morning, goes to the sheriff's office in his town to tell them about it. But, you know, this obviously is to no avail. Um, while in the car, and before I get to in the car, there's also kind of sketchy reports about how many people were actually out there that night when they went to the preacher's house. Uh, some stories say it was just Roy and JW with flashlights and 45s. Some stories, which I find interesting, say that Carolyn, the storekeep uh, storekeeper who had accused Emmett of saying these things, was actually in the vehicle that night. And once the boys came, once the two men came outside of the house with the boy, they actually approached the driver's side of the car and said, "Is this the boy?" And then she confirmed it. And then they placed him in the back of their truck and drove off. Who knows uh, what's for sure? But it does play interesting because of what happens now, where we're at in the future now. Um, so they drive around for three hours. And the reason they drive around for three hours is that JW, who I said, who as I said, has a, a reputation for um, one hating black people, but two, uh, they just said that he knows how to quote unquote handle Negroes, which I take as he's very aggressive with them and he, he knows how to put them in their place or whatever they described as, um, control back then. And he, while hunting has found a bluff and he says the bluff is a steep, uh, not, uh, it's a cliff. It's like a steep cliff and it's a hundred feet down into water. That's even, uh, that's a hundred feet further down. And he says, what we're going to do is we're going to take the boy to the cliff. We're going to pistol whip him with our 45s. Then we're going to make him look down into the water and we're going to put the fear of God into him and, you know, basically have him admit to being wrong uh, and what he had did. Then we'll take it and then we'll basically be done. That's what they're saying in their confession was the plan. Problem was, it was so late at night that JW could not find that same cliff again. So instead, they end up going back to JW's house where there's a tool shed in the back. They take Emmett back there, tie him up, and they proceed to pistol whip him. Um, for a, for, a, I'm guessing a great while, uh, a, a bit of time there. And again, things get interesting here in the differences, not interesting, but just disturbing here in the differences, because you have, you have the killer's confession where they say they pistol whipped him, but they only pistol whipped him and continue to pistol whip him because he wouldn't admit to being wrong. In fact, he kept making statements like, and I will read the statements they say that he made. They said that Emmett said, you bastards, I'm not afraid of you. I'm as good as you are. I've had white women. My grandmother was a white woman. And so, and also was pissing them off, I guess, is that according to them, as they were pistol whipping him, he never once screamed or hollered or made any sound, uh, which was of course angering them because they, they want him to suffer for what he did. Here, the difference, and this is why I kind of don't believe them, because there was a another uh, sharecropper at the time, or field hand, or something. I'm not really sure what his title was, but there was an 18-year-old boy who happened to be near the shed uh, during this torture event. And he says, and I, I'll let him talk for himself. Another key witness was an 18-year-old sharecropper named Willie Reed, who said that on the morning after Emmett Till was abducted, he saw Emmett on a truck with six people. Roy Bryant, J.W. Milam, two other white men, and two black men who worked for Milam. Soon after, Reed said he saw the same truck parked in front of a barn managed at the time by Milam's brother and heard the screams of a young boy he presumed was Emmett Till. Today at age 67, Reed says he still cannot get those sounds out of his mind. I heard the screaming, beating, streaming and beating and then there was also another article i read where it said that you know you could hear emmett basically screaming for his life saying things like um uh please god uh please mom save me or please don't do it again things like that so i'm not it's 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 complicated to me because in one hand you want you kind of want this defiant young man you kind of don't want the 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 abusers to have won, to satiated that that desire for violence and pain out of this young man that even in the face of 
of horror, he was strong, you know, and stood up for for himself. At the same time, it's like, God, I hope it's also not true because you really, you would hope, you have to teach young men, ah, this sucks to say, but it's like, growing up, especially in the South, you teach your young men certain ways of surviving, and it's not always as honorable as, you know, you look death in the eye and you stand up 100% of the time. Sometimes you have to live to fight another moment. So you kind of at the same time hear this and you're like, man, I hope, I hope he also wasn't just continuously standing. He wasn't continuously defying them in the sense of like, you know, go ahead. I dare you to keep, to keep hitting me, keep whipping. You don't, you don't want that either. Cause you, at the end of the day, if there was something that could have kept the young man alive, I would have much preferred that than the story of bravery. You know, I, I take life over a story. Um, but either way, that's what they're saying occurred there uh, with him. And then I also, there's another reason I don't believe their telling of events, but we'll get to that once we get to the coffin. So basically, uh, once they realize that Emmett's not going to break, it is then said that JW makes this statement. And it is a paragraph, and I'm going to read him word for word here. Well, what else could we do? He was hopeless. I'm no bully. I never heard an N-word in my life. I like N-words in their place. I know how to work them, but I just decided it was time a few people got put on notice. As long as I live and can do anything about it, in words are going to stay in their place. In words are going to vote where I, in words aren't going to vote where I live. If they did, they'd control the government. They ain't going to go to school with my kids. And when an in word gets close to mentioning sex with a white woman, he's tired of living. I'm likely to kill him. Me and my folks fought for this country and we got some rights. I stood there in that shed and listened to that N-word throw that poison at me, and I just made up my mind. Chicago boy, I said, I'm tired of sending them your, I'm tired of them sending your kind down here to stir up trouble. Gee, uh, goddamn you, I'm going to make an example of you, just so everybody can know how me and my folks stand. And there's something else he says in there about, you know, how his, his, him and his folks fought for this country, and that takes me right back to that whole kneeling thing. And and the uh, Drew Brees comments, but I'm not gonna get in that. But it just again, there's that idea of you were the only ones to fight. But anyway, so that's kind of where the decision was made that okay, we're gonna kill Emmett Till. They say that Malam sat there trying to think about what they could use as a weight for his his grand plan, and he realized that he had seen a um, a uh, a fan used for cotton ginning. Or ginning cotton, which I think is uh, separating like uh, separating cotton from like its seeds and uh, lint. And so he had seen one, and he he and Roy put Milan, I uh, put put Milan, put Emmett back in their truck, and then drove to this area where they had where he had seen the fan at. And you know, at this t- point, light was starting to come up, and it is said that this is the one moment where. Milan was starting to feel worried because he's like, oh no, somebody's going to see us see the fan. Not about anybody seeing the boy because at this point, it's clear as day that they're not afraid of the law. They know the law is not going to do anything to them, but they are afraid of somebody seeing them steal somebody's property. Weird. Uh, So they get there to the fan and they make Emmett, who they say at this point is, how do they describe it? They said on the trip ride there, I guess they were asked why they think that Emmett didn't leave the bed of the truck. Because there were certain, there were multiple places where, quote unquote, they stopped. And they said Emmett could have dropped, uh, jumped out of the car and left. And their words are, they believe that he simply wasn't afraid of them. And because he wasn't afraid of them, he didn't believe that they were going to kill him. And so he stayed in the back of the vehicle. Again, I think this is them trying to justify their actions and saying that you know he's egging us on this is this is his fault that he ended up like this because he could have left at any point i don't really believe that's what occurred i mean they just pissed to whip the boy so i'm sure he's not exactly in any fighting in any 14 you know he's terrified um so he gets to the cotton gin area they make Emmett get out they make him go get the fan which is reportedly like 75 pounds uh, put the fan in the back of their truck, then they make Emmett lie back down in the truck, and then they drive uh, to an area on the Tally- Tallahatchie? Tallahatchie River. And they park about 30 yards away from the riverbank, make Emmett get out, make him carry 
Some people say he had to carry it. Some people say it was already wrapped around his neck and he had to drag it. I don't know if he could have drug it with it already wrapped around his neck because it's barbed wire. So I think he, he had to carry it and basically move it to the edge of the uh, uh, riverbank. Then they make Emmett undress. They make him take off his shorts, his, his pants, underwear, socks, everything. They make him get naked. And it is here that it is said, JW again asked Emmett, and I want to make sure I get the, the words right because it's, it's from their mouth. It is said that uh, Emmett was carrying the uh, fan. It says he staggered under it its weight, carried it to the riverbank. They stood silently, just hating one another. JW says, take off your clothes. Slowly, Emmett pulled off his shoes, his socks. He stood up, unbuttoned his shirt, dropped his pants, his shorts. He stood there naked. It was Sunday morning, a little before 7. JW says, you still as good as I am? Emmett says, yeah. JW says, you still had white women? Emmett says, yeah. The big 45 jumped in big Malam's hand. The youth turned to catch that big expanding bullet at his right ear. He dropped. Basically saying that JW shot him uh, on the right side of his head. And that's where Emmett's stories, well, it doesn't, I guess, technically end. Um, JW and Roy then move and tie uh, the wire around Emmett Till's neck, push the fan in the water, and Emmett is drug off in the uh, river. And he's found just a few hours later by little boys who are fishing in the river and happen to see feet sticking up and find Emmett Till. But that's the last that JW and Roy uh, interact with Emmett. Again, I don't believe this recounting of events of how he said it went down between this this final interaction between him and Emmett. One, because like I said, they, they pistol whipped this boy with 45s. I don't think he can talk. I do not think he could talk at that moment. Um, and I don't think this young 14-year-old boy was sitting there saying, yeah. yeah he, I, just, I find it hard to believe that this 14-year-old boy w was this defiant in the moment of death. He's, he's terrified. He was just pistol whipped by two white men. He, he doesn't know where his mom is, doesn't know where his fam, family is, probably doesn't know where he is. And there's a guy with a gun. So I think, once again, they're trying to justify what it is that, in their head, occurred. But I, And there's another reason I don't think it uh, it happened this way either. But, um, so that happens. Um, the boys find it. Sheriff finds out about it. And then he immediately, he's also known to be another big uh, racist and separationist. He immediately moves to have the body buried. Now, you know, I'm going to say his name because these aren't people I'm protecting. His name was the sheriff was H.C. Strider, who is also long dead. But he moves to move the body and have it buried quickly so they can be done with it. But the mother of Emmett Till and her name is, I believe, Mommy Till. Mommy Till. She fights to have her son sent up to Chicago so that they can have a, a proper funeral for him. And the body does eventually go up to Chicago. And this is where the infamous photo comes into play. And then, you know, again, uh, warning to those who are kind of queasy or don't deal well with graphic content. Because this is where I will be showing Emmett Till's face. But she moves that not only is this going to be like a, a huge community event where everybody in the community can come in and see the injustice that was done to her young boy. They are also allowed to take photos of her young boy because she wants it known to the world what occurred in the Deep South and what kind of law they have operating down there. His tongue had been choked out and it was lying down on his chin. I saw that uh, this eye was out and it was lying about midway the cheek. I looked at this eye, and it was gone. I looked at the bridge of his nose, and it looked like someone had taken a meat chopper and chopped it. And I looked at his teeth, because I took so much pride in his teeth. His teeth were the prettiest things I'd ever seen in my life, I thought. and. Uh, I only saw two. Who were the rest of them? They'd just been knocked out. And uh, I was looking at his ears. His ears uh, were like mine. They curled. They're, they're not attached, and they curled up uh, the same way mine are. And. I didn't see the ear. Where's the ear? And that's when I discovered 
a hole about here, and I could see daylight on the other side. I said, I wasn't necessary to shoot it. If that's a bullet hole, was that necessary? And I also discovered that they had taken an ax and they had gone straight down across his head and the face and the back of the head were separate. And that's where this famous photo that was published in Jet, Jet which was a, um, a highly prominent black, um, black weekly magazine at the time, uh, they published this photo and it, it circulated, circulated around the world and some people directly link it to the, the spark that ignited the civil rights movement. They say something like 95 days later, Rosa Parks was, you know, when she was sitting up front in the, the white section and they told her to move, it wasn't. It wasn't that one day she had an epiphany that I'm just not going to move. They said that in the back of her mind, she was thinking of Emmett Till and the photo she had seen. And it made then that decision that she was not, she wasn't going to have it anymore. Um, and I like, I like to think that that is true. But this is kind of where I, I kept saying that I didn't believe that their version of the events was that true. Because there's an interview with uh mommy till and so in listening in that listening to that it's clear that there was further torture than what was mentioned by these two men she's talking about it looks like his nose had been beaten in by a meat cleaver which i guess i could see if uh, somebody pistol whipped it you know um you'd have certain bruises but i don't know how you would get the markings of a meat cleaver unless somebody actually took a meat cleaver and left those indentations in your nose uh, you know and even if it wasn't from a meat cleaver and we're saying it was from the pistol how the hell did he talk with a busted nose? You're telling me he was he was that strong at 14 years old that he had a busted nose and was still talking? On top of that, she mentions he has no teeth. He's got two teeth. What was he talking through? You're not telling me that y'all beat this this young boy so badly, so badly that he had all of his basically all of his teeth except two left, and he was still talking to y'all like you know. I'm the big bad in the neighborhood. It's just, it. I, again, I feel like they're trying to paint black people as the, these, these, I don't even know how to put it, these superhumans that, oh, they can take it. They can take the pain. And then that's why we can keep giving them the pain because this is nothing to them. And, you know, it, it goes to this. There's a lot of, of talk about how black youths are, um, black black young men our young boys are automatically kind of thrown into like the danger category of already being men. And it said that Emmett Till was a big, big young boy for his age. You know, he was already, uh, I think 190 or something like that. He was a, he was, he looked like a man even by his own uncle's account. So I think that's what they're trying to paint is like, Oh, look, we didn't do this to a boy. We did this to a strong man. We did it to a beast. He could take it. You know, he, he deserved this kind of thing. And that's why I think it's BS. And it's not even counting the fact that his mother said his ear was cut off when the fuck did they mention cutting his ear off with a pistol whip this wasn't just pistol whipping that occurred so you know between that and then the young man who was near the tool shed and said i heard the screaming i heard him begging basically for his mother and for god to help him it does i don't think the what the killers told him was the truth which of course is not the truth i don't even know why somebody would believe that this is the truth when i, I guess we can get to that the two men were brought in on mur charges of murder and kidnapping to a segregated courthouse where their jury was all white men and they had the eyewitness testimony from the uh, preacher moses where there's an iconic picture of him pointing them out saying these are the two men who came to my house and took my young nephew then you had a uh testimony from the young man that i i brought up earlier i think his name is willie he went up on stand and said yeah i was near the tool shed i saw I saw six men, I want to say four white men and two white men with the young uh, with the young black boy and they took him to the shed, which is a whole nother thing is uh, this mentioning of two black men who were said to have either been uh, forced. Yeah, it's usually, they usually just said that they were forced to participate and these. I think one of them for sure is still alive, one of the black men and they're, they've been interviewing him and hounding him and getting him to confess and he stands adamant that he wasn't involved and he doesn't know how his name got mixed up in it, but it is said that he did work for Roy. Um, 
And anyway, that young man, he took the stand and he said, yeah, I did hear from that shed that belonged to Malam, a, a young boy getting beaten and screaming coming from there. And I saw them take a young boy in there. You know, it was clear as day what had occurred, but they, it took an hour, an hour. And the jury came back and said, not guilty. Um, and then one person even made the comment that the only reason it took an hour is that they stopped for a soda break to make sure it looked good. Um, from there, a few months later, when they realized that they couldn't be charged again because of double jeopardy, basically saying that you can't be charged for the same crime twice, the men were offered $4,000 by a magazine or, or a newspaper, I'm not sure which, magazine or newspaper, to basically get their side of the story. And in that, because they knew that they couldn't be charged again, they revealed that, yeah, we did kill them, and this is how we did it, and that was the story, the article that I was just reading from to y'all, uh, which is available. I'm reading it off of uh, PBS. Um, I think that I'll give you the title of the article, and it'll be in the description if you want to check out the story for yourself. It is a pretty short read, but a, a pretty horrific one, and it's called Approved Killing in Mississippi. And like I said, to me, it was the way they painted themselves and they tried to make themselves justifiable. I also think they tried to keep out the women and their part in it because they make it sound like the women were kind of innocent. Like, oh, we're going to keep the story from our men and we're going to protect that young boy, even though he didn't know. No, bullshit. That's not what occurred. No way. I think that uh, at least Carolyn for sure was um, active in what occurred like there's photos of the the wives and the men in the courthouse after the guilty uh the verdict is given and they're making out they're happy they're joyous you can see how she's looking at him reverent and this is i'm sorry this is a picture of carolyn by the way with their two children but they they, they knew what the fuck had happened that day they were at they were participants in it if they didn't actually participate in the torture they short they surely knew what their husbands had done and where we're at now with the emmett till case is basically um, it has been reopened. It's been reopened for like the last three years, I want to say, and they're supposed to reveal uh, their findings here pretty soon. And what occurred was a young man by the name of Tim Tyson published a book called The Blood of Emmett Till, uh, recounting his story. And towards the ending of the book, Carolyn Bryant, the young woman that we were talking about, who is now in her 80s, said to be in poor health right now, Basically confessed that, yeah, I made the whole thing up. It was a lie. None of that actually occurred. And because she said that, you know, there was a firestorm. You know, people were, were everywhere were talking about the fact that this young man over 65 years ago was basically tortured, beaten, and killed over this damn lie. And you're just sitting in bed now saying, okay, well, now I can tell the truth. It didn't really happen the way I said it happened. And so it opened up a case. Uh, by the FBI, but the FBI has not released no details about their findings. I know that uh, Tim had to basically give away like all of his notes and research to the FBI so they could look over it. There's supposedly a manuscript written by Carolyn that uh, he says, he calls it a memoir, but he also says it's like a flimsy memoir because it's only like 30 pages, but that's not due to be released to the public until 2036, I want to say, or until she passes away. And then there's still cousins and family. Yeah, I think they're only cousins now. They're left alive with Mommy Till's passing. But the cousins are basically saying that at this point, everybody who's pr pretty much participated in it has passed away. They got to live their life. So, you know, of course, there's not they're not really looking for somebody to charge, but they are looking for Carolyn to step up and tell the truth out loud for everybody to hear what actually occurred that day. Um, and, the, and that would kind of, I don't know, finally set them at ease or give them rest. And uh, for Carolyn's part, she hasn't been responding to anybody's chan uh, anybody's request to interview her outside of that one time she spoke to the book. Now age 70 and known as Carolyn Dunham, living in Greenville, Mississippi. While our cameraman was able to take these pictures of her, when I went to her house, she wouldn't answer the door. Moments later, her son, Frank Bryan, arrived, and we tried to talk to him. Can we talk to Mrs. Dunham? Can't talk to me either. Can I talk you get her to come out? No. I have some questions I'd like to ask her about Emmett Till. Okay. I'm sorry? I'm too bad. Will she come out and talk to us? Why don't I just hear you? Tell me again. No. She won't? No. Goodbye. I'm back? I said goodbye. Goodbye. Yes. You're leaving? No, you are. Yeah, and like I said, she's in poor health anyway. They're, they're not, I don't think she has much longer to live. And at that point, once she does pass away, maybe we can finally get some answers in the papers that will be released. But that's kind of where we're at right now with Emmett Till's case. But like I said, the reason I kind of 
dived into all of this is this, like I said, connection between white women and black men and the, the, the charge, the negativity, the danger that's associated with that. And like I said, I think it goes back to slavery days where, of course, it was highly, 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 highly frowned upon for a black man and a white woman to engage in any kind of relationship. And that's been throughout history. And I mean, that still continues to this day. I can think about it in my own life where uh, I went to high school in Pine Bluff, Arkansas for a little bit. And there was a white girl, me and her were just friends, went to a football game weren't doing anything sexual we just happened to sit beside each other she wore normal clothes she wore some 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 cutoffs and a t-shirt but i guess members from the church that were white saw her sitting beside me she they went and told her uh her father her father who you know goes to a mixed church has black friends apparently what not heard about this and basically kicked her out that night and then threatened to hang me from a tree so black men and white women it, it it's still it's still a dangerous thing and then i also think it's important to look at this in terms of of karen's because i know it's funny to kind of you know make these memes of like oh there goes karen again or to share these videos of, of a, a, a white woman acting out and saying you know blocking a black man from getting his, into his apartment or allowing him to leave his parking spot or you know calling the cops on him it, you know it it's easy to share these videos and kind of laugh off like oh she's gonna get which she what's coming to her, which is, you know, something like, I, I don't know, fire from your job, um, I, is usually what I see a lot of, but what I'm afraid of is I don't want to see it become so associated with the funny word Karen that people end up actually, you know, it, it loses the danger that's associated with somebody basically using your skin color against you, using authorities to, to carry out whatever agenda that person has in that moment, you know, whatever agenda that Amy had in that moment of calling the cops and then telling the cops, Hey, a black man is threatening me. It wasn't a good agenda for that black man. So I want to make sure that we don't lose that. When we start calling people caring like, let's also understand what these people are, are trying to do, like what it is that they're truly showing us about their person and their beliefs. And, you know, God forbid, what I, I don't want to see in the news is somebody lose their life. You know, because it wasn't recorded, it wasn't uh, jotted down in video evidence, and then we you know we end up 65 years later. We're sitting there, and that person's you know on their deathbed. And they're like, "Well, you know what? I made it up. I'm sorry. It's too late. I, I think it's bullshit." And then people can come back and be like, "Well, yeah, it, it was a lie back there, and we can't do anything to them. No, you should be in jail. I don't care how old you are. Somebody's dead. You got to live your life happily and free. And now that you're old and about to move on anyway, you think it's cool? You can come out and say I lied on that person? Absolutely not. Emmett Till ca case." pisses me off i don't care how old carolyn is, or carolyn is i i know the family is like at this point she's old i don't want to see her behind bars i don't give a fuck there's a 14 year old boy that was brutalized and is now dead because of her lie she should be behind bars and i mean that's really like the least of it like, she, like i said she's already in poor health so she got to live her life got to see her kids grow up got to have fun and smile laugh do all the things that we we would like to do in life emmett did not get that chance so that that's kind of my final thoughts on this case. I guess the um the final things that I want to bring up about this case is um one fuck you to all Karens. If you're a Karen, if you're a Karen by name, this is not apply to you unless you're acting like a Karen. But if you're a Karen by choice, fuck you. Two, um there were two girls, 13 and 15 that were found recently in Milwaukee. And, you know, that that's also an interesting case because these two girls went missing and the cops basically drug their feet and did nothing to find these two little girls, even though the community came out and said that, hey, we suspect that they were picked up part of this sex trafficking ring that we've been telling you about for a long time. And you should go check out these houses. Cops did nothing. The community went there. And as they went there, they started getting shot at. That's when the cops came, arrested the people in there. And guess what? They found the two little girls. So shout out to the community that went out there, made things happen, and got those two little girls safe back home. Um, hopefully, they have a, a, a speedy recovery. And, you know, my, my thoughts and my prayers are with them. And just really shout out to that damn community for going out there and not losing uh, more of their members because police drag their feet or they're upset about what's going on in the world or they feel that black lives matter less. Whatever the hell the problem is with that uh, uh, that unit, you know, shout out to the community. And finally, I want to send a, a special prayer to the family and to the um, person of and I, I'm sorry if I butcher her last name, but Vanessa Willin. G-U-I-L-L-E with an, um, 
uh, an accent in. That's the um, soldier, the Fort Hood soldier that's been missing for since April, I believe, young lady. Um, the, the family has been adamant that something foul play occurred, but the army was kind of looked like dragging their feet with pursuing the investigation until it got uh, national mo uh, news attention. It got celebrity attention. And now everybody's asking, where is this young lady? I know there was a body recently found and they haven't positively identified it as hers. But that that's another case that breaks my heart, especially uh, having served in the uh, army for five years. I My heart goes out to them and I really hope that their prayers and their wishes are answered and that she is okay and that that's not that body that's found. And if it's not that body that is found, that she's brought home safely to her family. And um, yeah, I guess that's really all I got to say. Thank you all for checking out another episode of An Education of a Black Man. And I hope to see you all in the next chapter.